On the 14th of October, 1066, an arrow pierced the eye of the English king, Harold Godwinson. This death sealed the fate of the English language. The English we speak today would be unrecognizable if it was not for this moment. English royalty ever since and down to the present day has not descended from Harold, but instead from the opposing, invading Norman French William the Bastard, better known as William the Conqueror. William subjugated the Anglo-Saxons in their own country and cared nothing for the native tongue. Government was henceforth conducted solely in French. English was regarded as a second-class language for centuries to come, but was still widely spoken. Many French words were assimilated into the language. About 29% of modern English words have a French origin. These are words that we use without realizing that we're actually using French words. Some words with Anglo-Saxon roots can be recognized by the logic in their construction. For example, the word understand can be understood by separating the two words under and stand. Under gives a sense of grounding and foundation, while stand gives a sense of support or stability. All of these qualities characterize what it means to understand. Consider the French borrowing comprehend, which means the same thing as to understand, but cannot be split into smaller English words. There are many examples of such compound Germanic word constructions that we still use today. Many of these we continue to use alongside their new French borrowings. Here are some examples. Handbook versus a manual. Kingship versus monarchy. Everlasting in the place of eternal. Flawless instead of perfect. Hanging instead of pendant. A woman's maidenhood versus her virginity. A forefather versus an ancestor. To withtake and to receive. Hearsay versus rumor. The downtrodden versus the oppressed. Freedom versus liberty. Woodwork versus carpentry. Woodland versus forest. And finally, graveyard in the place of a cemetery. Many archaic constructions that we no longer use as words still make some sense because of their self-explanatory quality. Here are some examples of words that have fallen out of favor and have been replaced by French borrowings. Year tide, which combines the words year and tide, used to be the word for season. A wander star used to be the word for planet. Even night used to be the word for equinox, which makes a lot of sense when you think about what an equinox is. It's a night where the day and night parts of the day are even. A word book versus a dictionary, which makes sense when you think about what is a dictionary. It's a book of words. It's a word book. A book stave in place of a letter. Book craft in place of literature. Because what is literature? It's uh, the crafting of books. It's book craft. Overlive in the place of survive, where the French borrowing survive happens to literally translate to overlive. Sur vivre, overlive. Overgive, surrender, think of to give over. A for speech in place of a preface. Think of the for in before, right? So for meaning before, for speech, a preface. Finally, want some in place of the poor, because poor people, I suppose, want some. They are wanting of some. French borrowings seem to have much more subtle and profound meanings as opposed to their literal translations into English. For example, profound in French simply means deep, whereas in English, a profound hole seems to be much more important and impressive than merely a deep hole. There are many such French-English cognates, which make learning French as an English speaker sort of amusing. Amusing itself is a good example because in French it plainly means funny, but the word amusing in English has more of a subtle sense. 
Here are some examples, and try to imagine for the French terms that they apply to a French aristocrat of the 12th century ruling over the Kingdom of England. Here are some examples. To think versus to be pensive. If something is easy, then the aristocrat finds it facile. Something to you which is big, the aristocrat might find grand. You live in a house versus the king lives in a mansion. You eat food, but the royalty eat nourishment. When you go across something, you cross it. But when a king goes, he traverses it. When you talk about things that happened, you tell a story. But when a king talks about the great things that happened, he talks about a history. You might go to bed in a room, whereas a king goes to bed in a chamber. You might wait on a friend, but you attend to a royal person. You might be happy, but your aristocrat might be content. Instead of mind, they spoke of spirit instead. Instead of improving something, the king ameliorates something. When you go to a new place, you travel. But when an important person travels, they go on a voyage. If you keep something to remember something, then that's a memory of yours. But if you're French, it's a souvenir. My hope in this video is to show you that even the words that we speak can have profound, deep roots into history.